All right, hello everybody. Welcome back from spring break. I hope that you all are well and that it was a nice week for you. I want to jump right in because today I'm excited about our topic, which is surrealism. Um, though I am sad and this is one that I enjoy being in class with you all for. Uh, it tends to lead to some really fun discussions. Uh, alas, obviously that's not where we're at right now, but I'm going to try to do as much as possible in terms of introducing you, uh, likely to a movement that's very familiar to most of you uh, and perhaps needs no introduction in a way, but uh, my hope of course is to give you a slightly different angle or lens on it than you may have ever uh, gotten before. I do want to make two uh, kind of introductory announcements before we dive into the material. One is simply to compliment all of you on how fantastic the responses that you've been doing on Moodle have been. I have really been enjoying reading them, grading them, giving you some feedback here and there, um, but I, I didn't want you to think that, the, that those are sort of just going into the ether. I am most definitely reading them and appreciating the, the rather uh, personal moments sometimes that you're sharing with me. Um, the uh, certainly in saying you know what things you liked best uh, in terms of what quote from the artist readings or writings that you did um, or um, even earlier when I asked you to to look at the Mondrians and and pick one that you you know you really enjoyed th those are so special to get those insights and I know many of us are very frustrated including myself by this distance learning mode um, but I'm actually feeling like I'm getting more insight and hearing from more of you than, I, than I'm able to in the classroom. And, and that's in a way very exciting. So thank you for those. The other the introductory thing I wanna say, I'm going to actually go ahead and share my screen, get this all set up here. Um, it has to do with the final exam. So I did over the break have a think essentially about the final exam and the format and um, after I don't know, some hemming and hawing. I decided essentially to just leave it exactly the way that your last exam was. Um, in a way, I, I, I feel like changing it maybe, you know, would, is, would be disconcerting in the sense that I want to create as much um, sort of, I don't know, coherence and sameness as I can as, as we try to finish out this semester together. So same format, you will on Moodle write me two essays, one as it says here on a single work of art that I will choose and give to you, um, or that I guess I should say the algorithm on Moodle will give to you, and the second uh, a comparing and contrasting essay in which you grapple with two works of art. Um, so essentially the same, I've, I've really taken this and, and kind of copied and pasted it for the most part. Um, it'll be the same format in terms of the exam will be held on our usual exam day. Uh, I won't expect you to write these essays or write this exam during the, the our normal exam time. You can if you want to, uh, but I'll open it same as I did before for a 24 hour window on May 8th on Moodle and you'll have all day in which to, to take it. It. Just note that as soon as you begin it, you'll have two and a half hours to complete it. Um, so that, you know, is, is the normal exam session. I think that's probably slightly more time than you need. Obviously, you had two hours to write these two essays before, and you all, for the most part, did a beautiful job. Uh, but I know some of you did struggle with that time, wish that you'd been able to reread your essays. So two and a half hours should really be uh, great in that sense. Um, the only additional thing I want to make sure that I point out and that you take note of is here. Um, and that is that in both of these essays, I would like you to spend a little bit of time, so maybe one additional paragraph uh, or more if you, if you can, if you want to write more, um, essentially addressing uh, why the work of art shown is a modern work of art. We've been grappling all semester with what modern art is. We've been developing theories, working with terms, uh, putting forward definitions and testing them, whether that was Clark's definition or the textbook's definition or some things that I've said and I'm going to say more today. Um, so what I'd like you to do is depending on which one of these you get, and these are all modern works of art that I've chosen down here that we're going over in this class, 
you should be able to speak to why this is an example of modern art and use one of the definitions or theories or some of the terms that we've come up with in order to say this. So I want you to do this both in the single work uh, essay and in the comparison one. Um, and I'd like, I think this will add a sort of further um, culminating element perhaps to our course that will be very satisfying, uh, I hope, for you to write and certainly for me to read in terms of all of these ideas that we've been grappling with all semester kind of coming home to roost. You will see that I've tried to pare down slightly the list compared to the, the last exam. I did not, as usual, make this a cumulative exam. That was one of the things I hemmed and hawed about, but I just, I just felt like you've got enough a hardship going on, or most of us do, uh, that making it a, a comprehensive exam uh, in terms of the, all of the material for the whole semester would only make it more difficult and perhaps more complicated for you in a way that I don't know we necessarily need to do. So as it says, this is somewhere, this exam, here it is, only covers the material from where we left off in your last exam, from De Stijl, uh, through Abstract Expressionism, and here are the 12 works that you could possibly be asked to write an essay on. So start prepping now. Uh, we're going to get through a, a good number of these today, really. We'll only have uh, a handful for the remaining three classes. Wow, three classes after today, or three lectures after today. Um, but that I wanted you to be aware of. So this study guide is on Moodle. It's there for the taking. Please read it over. Over more carefully than what I'm actually saying here uh, and feel free to email me questions or jump in in my Skype office hours if you need it. So diving right in. We left off last, not last week, but the week before the break, uh, thinking about this movement, spending one day essentially uh, talking about, or me talking about and you listening, perhaps talking uh, amongst those who are uh, in your realm, if you have anyone in your vicinity, about the evolution of de Stijl, the, the development of what Mondrian called neoplasticism. But really on a larger level, what we were grappling with is something we've been grappling with a huge portion of the semester which is the evolution of what is commonly referred to as abstraction, but we know perhaps we should better use the term non-objectivity um, as, as describing what's actually going on here uh, in terms of weak versus strong abstraction or pure abstraction and so on and so forth. So essentially Mondrian um, and the Dustyle movement was part of this evolution, a very strong and very important part of this evolution. I should note that this evolution that we've been tracking is not over we're going to get many of you already know, uh, the sort of culminating perhaps endpoint, depending on who you ask, in terms of this evolution of non-objectivity next week when we have our final movement under discussion, abstract expressionism. We have, even though I haven't been making that big of a deal of it, maybe in, in two weeks or so, also been tracking the various artistic reactions to World War I that comprise this moment essentially from about 1915 to uh, about 1940, essentially. So we are finally arriving today at the 1930s. We've been kind of stuck in the 19 teens and 20s uh, for quite a few weeks now. Not that it's a bad thing, uh, but these essentially are the four movements that we've covered some greater to a greater extent than others uh, in terms of understanding um, these artistic reactions and the different ways that artists, depending on what movement they were in, whether it was uh, German Dada or uh, the de Stijl that is characterizing the Dutch Netherlands, or over in Russia with constructivism. I know we spent a very brief lecture before things uh, changed for all of us in terms of our worlds, um, but these have been the reactions. I wanted to drive home a point that I think will become even clearer as we discuss I'm saying as we discuss, obviously, or not as, as I discuss, oh, it's weird, um, uh, surrealism today. Um, but I don't want to draw this binary too starkly, but I do think it's a binary that we should consider and that I would appreciate coming up perhaps on any essays you might write for me about any of these movements. Essentially, we can look at there being a kind of polarity between the two movements that arise in uh, Central Europe, in, in Germany and Austria in particular, though also certainly in France and New York in the case of Dada. Um, but if we think about Dada and the new objectivity um, in terms of what their core values were, what many, many of the artists with a few exceptions shared, we could essentially see that Dada was a kind of anti-stance, was a, was a stance of artistic 
um, and philosophical um, opposition to the status quo in terms of the works that we saw, especially in the case of Duchamp, really challenging what art was, what it had been considered to be, uh, this idea of the tradition of art, art with a capital A, so on and so forth. Um, on the other hand, we can see movements like de Stijl and constructivism as essentially the opposite of that, as in many ways optimistic, where Dada and the new objectivity were deeply pessimistic about the state of the world. Uh, we saw week before last, artists like Mondria wanting to posit uh, art, artworks that somehow brought the world together, that were optimistic in the sense that they envisioned a kind of universality where there had once been individuality. The same was true, even though I know I gave this such short shrift because of what happened uh, with our semester, but constructivism too was inherently a utopian proposition. It was about artists becoming almost kinds of technical engineers in order to help build this new socialist world, this new um, state that would be this great classless society that was envisioned in the wake of the Russian Revolution and the Civil War, which followed it. So whereas on one hand, we have this kind of oppositional stance, this kind of make art uh, unlike it's ever been made before, that certainly is something that's going on over here on the side of these more optimistic or utopian movements, uh, but it's uh, a facet that does allow us to see a kind of bifurcation between these two movements. Now, you might be beginning to wonder in this grand scheme, okay, so where does surrealism fall along this bifurcated sensibility? If surrealism is yet another artistic reaction primarily to World War I, which I'm here to tell you it is, so please write that down, surrealism, as much as it is an artistic reaction to World War I, interestingly sort of evades this system or is slippery in the sense that it is neither wholesale sort of anti or oppositional in the way that movements like Dada were, nor is it altogether optimistic or utopian in the sense of building some better future through art that brings people together, or creates a new society. Surrealism doesn't really want to have anything to do with that either. Instead, it slides in this realm of a kind of in-between uh, that is quite fascinating in its own right. So something to keep in mind in terms of these larger structures that we're envisioning or thinking through in terms of what modern art is and how each of these movements and the artists within them fit into this grand scheme. So here's the basic stuff that I would typically give you in class. I imagine you're still hopefully scrambling, writing down. Those of you who take notes uh, in, in class, I imagine are still doing so. We can talk about surrealism beginning debatably neither 1924, you'll often see as the initial date, or 1925, which is when the first actual exhibition takes place. Um, and surrealism is generally understood though there are those who would fight this idea to some extent, as something that's killed off by World War II, which begins in 1939. So this is a rather long-lived movement in the grand scheme of modern art. We've seen time and time again, uh, modern art movements being very sort of quick, just flash in the pan and then they're gone. Surrealism has a kind of longevity that's interesting. Uh, and it's similar, I think, a bit to Dada, which also has some, some nice longevity to it before it too um, is, sort of uh, crushed by the weight of uh, the return of war on the scale of the, the Second World War. We can see surrealism generally has some core tenets, uh, as I was kind of saying before, in terms of it neither entirely rejecting the aesthetic traditions of the Western world that, that you have been studying in art history classes for quite a while now, uh, nor is it kind of utopian in the sense of promising to cure society's ills in any sort of grander scheme. Instead, it's often seen as a kind of response to the moment, one that centers on reasserting old, very old-fashioned notions uh, of the invincibility of artistic genius. So in this sense, I think surrealism can be related uh, nicely to romanticism, to artists uh, like Delacroix, uh, who back in the 1830s, 1840s, also were asserting this notion of their individuality, their artistic genius, uh, the center of uh, sort of the universe being their own imagination, and so on and so forth. 
What's different though, and this is profound and important and different in ways that we should take note of here, is that the surrealists across the board found or attempted to find various ways to really tap into a whole slew of what we now call subconscious material. So the raw or basic impulses, the almost kind of animalian desires that characterize our lives as human beings, uh, the fears, instinctual, deep-seated, subconscious uh, fears that guide our behavior, whether we know it intentionally, uh, act on, through it or on it or not. Um, what they were hoping to do was essentially to give form to the unconscious, and we're using unconscious here uh, as it has been, had been been theorized by Freud. Uh, and Freudian texts, this is the moment in which Freud is coming to the fore. Freud is alive, certainly, as surrealism is arising. At the turn of the century, it was when he had first published um, various texts and treatises that became very important and very widespread in cultural uh, thought, like the interpretation of dreams. Uh, but uh, Freud, continuing in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, is alive and is continuing to produce these theories, uh, which are so influential on the, the uh, surrealist artists. And I should perhaps point out, uh, ironically, maybe a little bit, but, but beginning to hopefully give you a little bit more of a sense of this movement than you already have. And I do, I am often aware as I teach surrealism that this is a movement that a lot of people like, that this is a movement that a lot of you already know about, have perhaps done research on yourselves. Um, I know in other classes you're also encouraged to think about and work on or through surrealist uh, sort of modes. But I'm here to tell you, you know, to give you this slightly different um, uh, lens on this. And I guess the first thing that I would say is that Freud, because he was alive when the surrealists were practicing in this way, in, in, in working sort of with his theories, Freud generally thought that the surrealists were a kind of a big joke. Um, he did not believe, or maybe that's overstating it, he, Freud did not believe um, that what the surrealists ta took as their central uh, sort of drive, which was to tap into the unconscious, to give form to the unconscious, Freud said that wasn't possible, period, sort of point blank. Um, so we might take that in stride in terms of uh, thinking about the interrelation between someone who's alive and theorizing the, the basis for what is modern day psychoanalysis um, and the artists who are inspired by these ideas and yet Freud is very resistant to this whole thing um, and does not by any means embrace this movement or the artists within it. So we should also take note, and this is something we'll get into a bit more uh, when we focus on surrealist women on uh, Thursday, the, the surrealist theory of genius, this invincibility of artistic genius that they're so centered on um, is also highly centered on masculinity. Uh, for, by and large, most of the surrealists, um, only men can really be geniuses. Um, and it is their sort of creative work that is the center of this movement, and they're very resistant, uh, by and large, to women uh, being a part of this and, and to the idea that women <clears throat> can do this work. They are instead going to find a use for women, as most artists, as we've seen in this uh, modern art period, do. And that is, they use women as muses. Uh, if women themselves can't be sort of artistic geniuses, uh, they can be catalysts uh, for um, artistic experimentation, as we're going to see of various kinds. So keeping this in mind today, and certainly seeing how this comes to the fore in an even uh, different way um, as we get into uh, more of this on Thursday, continuing with this material on Thursday. So as so often has been the case this semester, I thought I would begin by introducing you to the Surrealist Manifesto. Uh, yet again, this is another one of these movements that has a manifesto. Uh, it was written by uh, the absolute center of this movement. No, it wasn't Salvador Dali, as some of you uh, may uh, know that artist and the centrality now in the public imagination of Dali uh, to this movement. It was instead a man named Andre Breton, um, who was the absolute gatekeeper of this movement. He decided who was a surrealist. He decided if you were out and kicked a number of people out at various moments. Um, and he wrote this manifesto 
that I'm going to read just a, a brief portion of to you uh, to give you a sense of, of the flavor of it, maybe compared to the Dada Manifesto, Felsenbecker, the Marinetti, Futurist Manifesto, uh, the Malevich. I mean, we've had so many at this point that we've read. And you all did a beautiful job responding to those. Again, on Moodle, I really enjoyed uh, the work that you did, uh, depending on which artist you chose to read. So the Manifesto um, starts not nearly with quite the same bang, we might say, as the, the Futurist Manifesto. It's not not nearly uh, quite as, as punchy <clears throat> in terms of, you know, crashing in your car and celebrating having done that. But we do begin uh, kind of right off the bat to get a sense of what's important to Breton and is therefore going to be important to the Surrealists more generally, um, uh, kind of from the very beginning. This is not the first line of the Surrealist Manifesto. And I should point out, you can find this uh, online in lots of good translations. And, and I encourage the, you know, those of you who don't have this assignment, I think for Professor Baldridge, where you read this and respond to it, um, it's available to you maybe over the summer to have a look at. So what's important to Breton? Right off the bat, quote, beloved imagination, what I most like in you is your unsparing quality. So if we were in class, I would say, what's he saying he loves? What's he saying surrealism centers on? What is the sort of thing that's valued in surrealism? And hopefully, or I imagine, a number of you would put your hands up and somebody would say, it's this thing, it's imagination. And you would be absolutely correct. I mean, look at the, the language he uses to talk about imagination. He says, beloved imagination, almost as, it's, as if it's his lover. And I would say, if there is a sort of uh, great lover or artistic muse of surrealism, aside from the, the sort of crucible that is women's bodies, as we're going to see, as usual, um, it is the imagination, the thing they celebrate, the thing they're most excited about kind of parsing through uh, or exploring or shining a flashlight in all the dark corners of is this thing, the imagination. And as uh, Breton says, the thing he likes about it is that it is unsparing, that it does, the imagination, it goes places that are dark, that are wild, uh, that are perhaps uh, unreasonable. The things we do in our imagination are, by and large, hopefully, most of the time, not things we would necessarily act on. They're instead uh, the stuff of the mind, and they are therefore unsparing, they're raw, uh, and interesting for this realist uh, as a result. So he continues um, in, in, in this manifesto, and I think we can continue to see some of these themes that we've started with in terms of the unsparing quality of the imagination, uh, again, time and time again coming to the fore. So Breton says, and I invite you again to, to read with me, I'll maybe read it slightly more slowly in the interest of uh, having you hopefully join in wherever you are and, and whatever your <laughs> circumstances are. So here's André Breton quote, under the pretense of civilization and progress, we have managed to banish from the mind everything that may rightly or wrongly be termed superstition or fancy. Forbidden is any kind of search for truth which is not in conformance with accepted practices. It was apparently by pure chance that a part of our mental world which we pretended not to be concerned with any longer, and in my opinion by far the most important part, has been brought back to light. Here it is again. The imagination is perhaps on the point of reasserting itself, of reclaiming its rights. So again, if we were in class, I would say, what is he pushing against and what is he embracing? What is Marinette, sorry, Marinetti, Breton uh, sort of saying has gone wrong in, in society or in civilization? And what does he hope the surrealists are able to do in, in terms of uh, changing things over? I would ask you to kind of read it over again, think about it, paraphrase it, yeah, under the pretense of civilization. So you can already tell right off the bat, 
part of what he's resisting is civilization, is this notion that we should be civilized, that we should not uh, act out on uh, or act in a manner stemming from our superstitions, our fancies, our imagination. Uh, but alas, this sort of conformity that he sees with accepted practices, being socialized creatures in a general sense, is what he's resisting, is what he hopes um, the surrealists will sort of no longer be concerned with any longer. And instead, what he wants to come back to light is this stuff, is superstition, is fancy, is what is forbidden, and is boom, here it is, the imagination. He wants the imagination to reassert itself, to reclaim what he perceives to be its rights, which have been dampened by what has been called civilization and progress, i.e. what has been called modernity, a thing we've been studying all along. So finally, fairly late in the game in the manifesto, he gives it a hard and fast definition, which we might compare in, in some ways to um, the uh, futurist kind of giving us that bullet point list finally, the 11 things that many of you pointed out uh, in the essays that you wrote for me for the second exam. Uh, this is about as close as we get to, uh, with surrealists and with Breton uh, to a kind of hard and fast definition. So let's look at it. He says, what is it? Surrealism, a noun pure psychic automatism in its pure state. You might be looking at that like, what? Like pure psychic automatism, what, like, what the hell does that mean? We're, don't worry, hang on to that, we're gonna, we're gonna unpack it more. By which he means, by which one proposes to express what? The true function of thought. So whatever this pure psychic automatism thing is, he hopes what it does is reveal the sort of pure functioning of our internal thought system. Thought dedicated in, and here we again get this theme, the absence of all control exerted by reason and outside all aesthetic or moral concerns. So thinking about this, if I gave you more time, maybe you would probably, if I asked you in class, you know, what, what does this remind you of? you might realize that this is similar to the Dadaists. Remember, they wanted to cast aside reason, cast aside sort of typical aesthetic concerns. Think about Duchamp with his bicycle wheel. Um, so to operate outside of all aesthetic concerns, uh, but this one maybe is like the futurist, to operate outside all moral concerns. Does this sound like a good idea to you? Um, this you know, foundation of coming from a place that is anti-moral, that is anti-aesthetic, that is anti-control, the absence of all control exerted by reason, this, I think, reveals itself in terms of this movement yet again, like the others being a reaction to World War I, being a reaction uh, to the state of the world, the condition of humanity, the realization of man's inhumanity to man, and this idea that there is no such thing as reason, there is no such thing as civilization, what has been called progress uh, and modernity has not really been progress at all, and instead we should go back to some sort of pure automatic state in which there is no control, there is no reason, uh, and we operate outside, any sort of moral concerns. If we had more time, I would also relate this back to Nietzsche, this idea of God is dead that we covered many weeks ago is most definitely deeply uh, related or influential on the surrealists in terms of this anti-moral stance that they have. So what are the major themes here? We've already been seeing them. The absence of all control, the absence of reason, imagination is another way of saying the absence of reason, what your imagination does is sort of going into this other realm. A search for truth, we've seen that time and time again. This idea of chance, or this is what he's gonna mean by pure psychic automatism, imagination again, and so on and so forth. These, I think, are the major themes Teams, um, and what we want to work on as we, ooh, here we go, begin to actually look at some surrealist works. So I want to better understand or extrapolate on this idea of what he means by the absence of control, the absence of reason, uh, what he means by this thing that I said, put a pin on it, pin in it, and we'll hold on to it, the pure psychic automatism, um, and look at first at uh, a surrealist practitioner that really is very important and that does not get discussed generally enough 
in terms of this movement, and his name is André Massel. Um, he's a French artist. Your textbook says more about um, his difficult life and um, and sort of strivings, and I'll leave that for you to read. Hopefully you're still reading in the textbook chapter. Um, but what we have an example of here on the right is what is known as an automatic drawing. Um, now, if we were in class, I would actually have you experiment with this a little bit, uh, but your textbook, describes this as essentially trying to make a drawing or trying to produce a, 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 a work of art that <clears throat> is not guided by maybe the usual structures of what is essentially copying, right? You're trying to translate the things of the world, draw a coffee cup, draw a cell phone, draw, you know, what, whatever it is uh, in such a way that it mimics reality. What automatic drawings seek is, is to let the subconscious roam free. To, so to, in some cases, sometimes it involves not picking up your pen, or uh, it can involve beginning a drawing and uh, sort of beginning to see shapes form and letting them guide you. But again, it's about tapping into these raw, psychic, uh, internal, imaginative realms that are not guided by reason, that are not guided by um, figuration, by control, by any of the usual aesthetic parameters. So essentially, the surrealists initially develop a bunch of techniques uh, by which they experiment with various kinds of free association, various kinds of automatic drawing, automatic writing, automatic painting. Um, so free association is, in case you need a kind of further definition of it, this idea of allowing words or images to suggest other things. Um, so again, drawing freely until you begin to see certain forms or certain shapes emerge, maybe a hand here, maybe a face here. These are just me sort of uh, you know, musing, um, and, but without imposing any rational connections or structures, again, trying to gain access to the unconscious, even though Freud said, no, no, that's not, that's not possible, stop trying to do that. What the surrealists believe they could do is exactly this, is tap into these raw uh, parts of the unconscious, what Breton in the manifesto is calling pure psychic automatism, essentially to let the mind automatically do what it's going to do, to let it to perform the associations it's going to by not inhibiting it through reason, through control, uh, through any kind of the, the usual aesthetic structures. So aesthetic corpses, if you've never played this game, uh, you know, is explained further in the textbook. Uh, and this would be something if we were in class together, oh, it'd be so fun, you know, you know maybe do this if you, if you have someone where you're living now. Uh, friends, partners, family. Um, essentially what it is, is a kind of free association game that can be played with words, but in the case of Exquisite Corpse specifically, is, is with imagery. So um, you would take a piece of paper, kind of fold it up um, until only one small corner or portion is there. Uh, the first artist would just, in terms of free association, draw whatever first came to his or her mind. In this case, let's say it was this bullseye. Um, then it would get partially full folded over so that the whole image was not revealed, uh, and a new section would be opened up, and you would pass it to the next artist without talking to each other, without sort of explaining, and based on whatever portion that person could see, they would continue the drawing. So in this case, a pipe. Then same, fold it over and reveal a, a new area of the piece of paper, pass it to the next person, and whoever got this must have thought that this looked just like a, a flower pot and therefore drew this flower pot coming out of it. And so on and so forth until at the end of the game, when everyone has had a chance to, to draw uh, their addition to this grand scheme, you would unfold the whole thing and you would see this ridiculous, essentially, uh, uh, sort of tapped in to the, the subconscious or uh, irrational connectivity was what's highlighted in the drawing. So this is essentially where surrealism begins with these kinds of experiments. But ultimately what it develops into is yet another one of these movements that has a kind of bifurcated sensibility. And I hope now is where I'm perhaps contributing uh, beyond the knowledge that many of you already have about this movement, uh, and in particular uh, about Dali as one of his central practitioners. So on one hand, you get the practice of certain surrealist artists like Masson, and we're going to look at another one of his works in just a moment that is in the realm of the abstract. 
We call this branch of surrealism the biomorphic, um, but it is yet another sort of um, development on the, the path of non-objectivity. Uh, as I was just pointing out, obviously this free association drawing um, or automatic drawing does not have at its root a, a sort of logical or coherent um, figural or form uh, to be recognized. Instead, it's the sort of um, uh, the, the unfolding of the, the interior of the mind that has not uh, been sort of based in logic or based in, in formal properties. So this side of things is uh, predominated by automatism of these various uh, kinds of experiments that I was just describing, free association, automatic writing, uh, uh, so on and so forth. The other side of surrealism is probably the one that you know. Um, it is the, the side of things that Dali and uh, Rene Magritte, who we're going to talk about today, also are on. And it is the naturalistic, uh, as opposed to the biomorphic or abstract. So in this neck of the woods, we get a grand return to not just recognizable imagery, but really high-pitched naturalism really intense realism, almost photographic in many ways, uh, in the case of Dali and, and Magritte, as we'll see. So really meticulous attention to detail, but often at the same time kind of distorted or combined in what are rather fantastic ways. And the persistence of memory painting down here is a great example. Obviously, everything in this is high pitched in terms of the naturalism. We can recognize ants and clocks and trees and water and, and hills or crags or mountains mountains, so on and so forth. But at the same time, they are, they have been distorted. They've been combined in ways that are fantastical that move away from the naturalistic per se. So we'll begin briefly with the biomorphic. Um, again, Andre Masson is really the leading force in this regard. This Battle of Fishes from 1926 is generally considered one of the great masterpieces of biomorphic surrealism. It is yet again him experimenting with uh, these techniques of automatic uh, drawing. Uh, in this case, he placed um, or poured, I should say, glue uh, in a way that was randomized, that was not meant to evoke any naturalistic imagery. Um, he really kind of let it flow as, as it would. And then he uh, all, and then he added sand to the canvas, such that the sand, which is what you're seeing here, stuck uh, to the canvas. Um, and he let these sand glue forms suggest to him uh, what should the, what the depiction actually was. So again, coming from this kind of raw, bizarre state, coming from a place of abstraction, but then ultimately leading to forms that are recognizable. Wait, is this backwards? No. Oh, it's upside down? Something's different. Huh? Oh, sorry about that. What did I... I feel like I'm wigging out right now. Is this upside? One of these is upside down. This one is correct. Okay, this one's correct. Um, I, well, is it? I don't know. Maybe you know. <laughs> Yikes! Uh, I'll follow up with you on that. I never noticed. God, I've taught. I've taught with these these two slides. I did not change, and I never I never saw this or recognized this. All right, I'll get to the bottom of it and follow up with you in the next lecture. Um, anyways. What this is about is a uh, chance. So what's being added in here to what he ultimately calls the battle of the fishes. So these forms that the, the random sand glue structure uh, made suggested to him a sort of underwater scene in which fish were fighting with one another, which is what you can see he's added in, in terms of drawing and in terms of color uh, and charcoal and, and so forth. And so forth. Um, but this is the sort of moment in which we get the uh, the invasion of chance into art making. This is where we're ultimately going. Chance and the sort of random um, and the uncontrollable is going to be exactly where the abstract expressionists are going to go uh, once we begin looking at post-World War II art next week as in our final week. Um, but this uh, is the more sort of influential side of things, the biomorphic surrealism, in fact, than the naturalistic. Uh, which is what exactly is being resisted by artists like Rothko and Pollock and Krasner and Frankenthaler, uh, again, who we'll talk about next week. Now, I know that this man, this figure, this painting is probably 
most of you think of when we think of surrealism, um, I am actually going to, as I usually do, uh, skip it, uh, resist it, leave the section in the textbook on this painting for, for you if you are interested in learning more about it. I, though, again, I imagine most of you know a great deal about it. The only thing I do want to point out, uh, as I so often do, is to give you something of a, a, an in situ uh, view at it, and that is to point out that this thing is very small. I think often, especially in the classroom, from when the uh, persistence of memory gets blown up really, really big. Uh, students think it's a huge painting, uh, but alas, it has the kind of uh, uh, presence of a Vermeer of some of the Dutch Golden Age uh, paintings. It's very small, and for that reason, often it's, uh, it's missed. It doesn't uh, always have a huge crowd around it, even though it's such a famous painting, and it is at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, this is one of my <laughs> former students who sent me a picture um, in front of it, uh, and I, of course, encourage all of you to over the years send me these pictures. So in past years some I've spent a good amount of time talking about Dali's various influences, again, talking about how Dali becomes Dali the same way that we did with Malievich and Mondrian and Picasso. Um, I will only, whoops, go again, spelled wrong here, sorry. I will only point out very briefly um, that Dali is not immune to exactly the same system of development that we've seen with artists time and time again in terms of him looking very profoundly in his early years as an artist. So this to sort of Dali before he becomes a surrealist and experimenting essentially with the kind of post-impressionism that we associate with Cezanne and Van Gogh, but in particular Gauguin is very, very influential for him. Uh, Dali, but also Picasso. What Picasso is doing at the very beginning of the 1920s uh, in terms of this weird turn to classicism uh, is very much what Dali is interested in, as you can see from the dates, around the exact same time. But the one Dali that I do want to focus on um, perhaps shows you a slightly different side of him, and again, uh, is part of this sort of ramp up, this development uh, along the path of Dali becoming the artist that we associate so strongly with this naturalistic side of uh, surrealism. This is a painting known as the female bather. It's one of a series of many sort of bathing beach pictures that he did in and around this year, 1928. It is a mixed media work. You might be noticing uh, that it is, the medium of it is oil and sand on panel. This is the sand down here, obviously. This is the oil up here. Um, but what you can see here is, I think, the influence initially for Dali, who ends up joining the Surrealist movement quite late, I should point out, as you saw. Surrealism develops 1924, 1925, and he's still not quite a Surrealist by 1928. He's instead experimenting with this kind of of, uh, automatic drawing uh, technique that we associate more with Masson, though he does begin in his experiments with film in particular, and this very famous film some of you uh, may be uh, familiar with, En Chien Andalou, The Andalusian Dog, uh, comes right after he makes these kind of beach bather pictures um, and is constitutes to a large extent um, the, the breakthrough, the breakthroughs I should say, that he begins to have in and around those years, in and around 1929, 1930, which is when Dali uh, becomes, I think, the artist that we associate stylistically with, with uh, sort of this naturalistic form. But he said things like this, quote, I believe the moment is at hand when it will be possible to, and get this, what does he want to do? To systematize confusion and thus to help discredit completely the world of reality. So yet again, you know, I, I always question what, what these surrealists were trying to do, what they were thinking about, what was important to them. Um, I, I understand from a social historical perspective, you know, what they're grappling with in the wake of the destruction and the, the death and the violence and the awfulness of World War I, um, you know, this sort of turn to extreme forms of, uh, of uh, chaos, the, almost the embracing of chaos, we might say. Um, but this idea of, you know, embracing or systematizing confusion to dis, uh, the idea of embracing, discrediting completely uh, the world of reality, 
I find this troubling from a, from a moral standpoint. You know, I think history tries in its best forms and its idealized or utopian form um, to give us a better grasp of reality, to give us a better sense of where we are in the grand perspective of what came before us and, and where we are now and perhaps where we're headed as well. So, you know, the surrealist and the Dadaist desire to discredit reality, to embrace chaos, um, to sink into the, the sort of most grotesque parts of the mind to tap into raw impulses, fears, desires, um, including, you know, the kind of distortion that's been done to the female body here. Um, and I'll show you some more details of this in a moment, or the embracing of one's sort of own perceptive strangeness um, in the case of the persistence of memory. You know, this, this I find troubling. Um, but that, that's just me. There's no reason you can't love this movement. Again, I know this is a beloved movement in the grand scheme, and I, I don't want to, oh my gosh, I still have so much I want to talk about, but I'm trying to be better about keeping these to about 45 minutes. All right, well, maybe I'll cut off soon, and we'll return to this material uh, on Thursday. So, I want to give you a little assignment here um, in terms of what I'd like you to do as a response to this week's material. Um, I saw this on the MoMA's website years ago, and I kind of like this idea. I, you know, as much as I'd love for us to try out an exquisite corpse or something, I couldn't quite figure out how we could do that remotely in a way that that is um, successful. So why don't you send me a postcard, <laughs> a pretend postcard, um, from the inside of a surrealist painting? So I'd like you to choose either Dali's The Persistence of Memory, so the ones that we were just looking at, this one, or this female bather, and imagine what it would be like to actually spend a day as though you're on vacation in one of these two landscapes, one of these two spaces. Go on to Moodle after you've spent some time looking at it and essentially write me a postcard like, hey, Dr. Lee, nice, you know, nice, uh, uh, look where I am um, and describe to me, you know, what, what the location that you're in is like. So uh, do some essentially visual analysis, what it's like to spend a day on the beach with this lovely female bather. Uh, or what it was like to spend a day on vacation in the melting clock zone. Uh, describe to me what it's like to be there and maybe more importantly in the surrealist sense, describe the mood that was created by your location of choice. Um, so I think this will be really fun to read, at least for me. Hopefully they'll be fun to write. Again, trying to think through what surrealism is, what these spaces that it's creating are, what it means to try to tap into the raw impulses, desires, fears, the imaginative anti-control anti-reason space. Maybe as far as like a couple of concluding points today, I want to drive this home about to this uh, Dali female bather that in terms of the distortion we see to this woman's body laying here uh, on the beach, um, we, this returns us, of course, to the space of cubism, to the uh, kinds of experiments that Picasso, in particular, performed on female bodies as yet again, this kind of crucible of modernist striving and searching. I actually think that Dali, in some ways, uh, performs uh, distortions that are maybe more disturbing. They're disturbing in a different way. Um, this really uh, teeny tiny kind of awful foot down here, but then this grotesquely obese kind of knee area, the varicose veins and what I always perceive to be kind of random uh, hairs uh, growing on the upper thigh, then the way that the, the pubic area is handled, the, the vulva, um, and then uh, on the other side of this, compared to this very teeny tiny sort of grotesquely miniaturized foot, we get this grotesquely uh, huge monumental hand uh, that again is distorted in this way that, that seems to speak to pain to me. Same thing being done to the breasts, again up here looks to be almost as though it's a hairy chest, um, this little pin head here, uh, but with the, this gaping jaw, these teeny tiny eyes that barely seem to be able to, to see. Um, this certainly returns us to the space of Picasso and maybe importantly, uh, returns us to the space of thinking about um, what Picasso is still doing. Picasso lives a long, long time and is embraced in a certain moment in the late 20s and early 30s by the surrealists, um, though he does not himself ever claim to be or profess himself to be a surrealist. I think they want him to be a surrealist more than he wants to. Um, but these are the kinds of works that he's making. I think you can see how much Dali is influenced by Picasso. 
in the late 1920s. Uh, the kinds of grotesque distortions, again, of women bo women's bodies, but not in a cubist way any longer. He's doing different kinds of work now. Uh, but interestingly, in this same sort of moment within the span of two or three years of each other, Picasso comes out with his own series of uh, bathing beauties here in, in 1930 and 1931, um, which your textbook talks about in terms of, of the sort of his interest in sculpture, uh, these bone paintings that they're sometimes referred to as. I think this is a bit of a cop out myself. I love your textbook, but this is not the moment I think and that they necessarily do justice to these. As usual, uh, I wanted to give you a sense of scale. I mean, just look how sort of grotesque these are, uh, how the body has been taken apart, these breasts almost excised from the body, these two strange bestial forms tonguing each other, uh, the way that the face has been taken apart here, but is still weirdly recognizable, the little eyes, the nose, the mouth, Oh, that's really weird. It totally glitched out. I don't know if it's still going, if it's recording. All right, I better wrap up because I feel like something bad just happened. Um, we will continue with this material uh, and pick up sort of right where we left off. I do still want to talk about Magritte on Thursday uh, and the women uh, surrealists. <laughs> which are so often given a very short shift, we're going to bring them in in a strong way in our class. All right, everybody, I hope this works. Thank you. Bye, see you on Thursday.